Good morning. morning. Welcome to God's house here at Good Shepherd Lutheran Church. Uh, It's great to have the chance to be with you here today uh, and with those who are joining us online also. So we are continuing the Advent season today. It's the third Sunday in Advent, if you're keeping score at home. But uh, for Advent, we've been continuing this series on the King Shall Come, right? We know Jesus, our true King, uh, God, that God was going to send him at just the right time. And today, we're thinking about how God's sending Jesus to us. Uh, we're reminding that he is also bringing perfect joy to us. We're thinking about what that means to have joy in our Savior's coming to us. So that will be the focus of our worship today. And we'll begin then with our opening hymn. <laughs> stand. We follow the order of service today. It's found in your worship folder and on the screen behind me. And we begin in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Let us confess our sins to the Lord. Holy God, gracious Father, I am sinful by nature and have sinned against you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have not loved you with my whole heart. I have not loved others as I should. I deserve your punishment both now and forever. But Jesus, my Savior, paid for my sins with his innocent suffering and death. Trusting in him, I pray. God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Our gracious Father in heaven has been merciful to us. He sent his only son, Jesus Christ, who gave his life as the atoning sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. 
Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord for the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord for the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Hear our prayers, Lord Jesus Christ, and come with the good news of your mighty deliverance. Drive the darkness from our hearts and fill us with your light. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Our God speaks to us in his word this morning, first of all, from the Old Testament prophet Isaiah, uh, portions of chapter 61, and this will also serve as the basis for the sermon this morning. The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me, because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives, and release from darkness for the prisoners to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn and provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. They will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. I delight greatly in the Lord. My soul rejoices in my God. For he has clothed me with garments of salvation and arrayed me in a robe of his righteousness. As a bridegroom adorns his head like a priest and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. For as the soil makes the sprout come up and a garden causes seeds to grow, 
so the sovereign Lord will make righteousness and praise spring up before all nations. The word of the Lord. And then we also hear God speak to us from the Apostle Paul's uh, first letter to the Thessalonians, chapter 5. And here we, we sort of, this is kind of the end of this particular letter, and there's kind of some general encouragements that Paul gives. And, and part of it is to rejoice always, right? And, and so it means that rejoicing isn't always only in happy things, because in this life we have happy things and not so happy things. But we can rejoice because of our God keeping his promises to us through his son and the forgiveness, life, and salvation we have through him. Uh, So we read here this section of 1 Thessalonians 5. Rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Do not quench the spirit, do not treat prophecies with contempt, but test them all, hold on to what is good, reject every kind of evil. May God himself the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. The word of the Lord. And please stand. And our gospel for today is from the Gospel of John, chapter 1, uh, where we see, again, John the Baptist, son ahead, uh, preparing people to Jesus, uh, pointing back, or pointing ahead, I suppose you could say, pointing ahead to Jesus with joy and saying, this is the one who's going to do what you need him to do, right? Uh, John said he wasn't worthy to even untie his sandals, and he does it with joy, not, not of jealousy, but, but joy of what the Savior would do for him and for us. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. Now this was John's testimony when the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem sent priests and Levites to ask him who he was. He did not fail to confess, but confessed freely. I am not the Messiah. They asked him, then who are you? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? He answered, no. Finally, they said, who are you? Give us an answer to take back to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? John replied in the words of Isaiah the prophet, I am the voice of one calling in the wilderness. Make straight the way for the Lord. Now the Pharisees who had been sent questioned him, Why then do you baptize? If you are not the Messiah, nor Elijah, nor the prophet. I baptize with water, John replied. But among you stands one you do not know. He is the one who comes after me, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. This all happened at Bethany, on the other side of the Jordan, where John was baptizing. The Gospel of the Lord. And you may be seated for the next hymn.
Grace, mercy, and peace are yours from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Friends, we're, we're getting to that time of year when a lot of gifts are, are tending to be given, right? And, and maybe depending on different groups you've gone to, maybe that's already started for you. Uh, but I'm going to say something that's pretty obvious, but it's worth thinking about for, for what we're here to do today, and that is not every gift is going to have the same, going to get the same reaction from the person who receives it, right? Now, maybe we see this a lot uh, in little kids sometimes because they really kind of wear their heart on their sleeve, so to speak. I mean, they really tend to show their emotions. And, and with gifts, you know, if there's a gift that, uh, that, that a child really likes and is really excited about, again, usually you know it. And, and it's, a, it's a neat thing to see. And it's, you know, it makes everyone happy, whether they're the giver of the gift or not. You know, just kind of, oh, you know, you can't help but, but be excited at that. And at the same time, and maybe you've seen this too, a gift that is not particularly, you know, loved uh, by a child, you can see that sometime in the reaction. And the thing is, it's not really just children who go through this. Um, all of us um, will feel different way about gifts. And, and actually, and I was thinking about, you know, why that is. And there is just, there's the whole difference of between a gift we want and a gift we don't want, right? And that's certainly true. And we know people do their best when they're giving a gift. Um, They're not trying to give us something we don't want. But there's another kind of difference which might play into this uh, sometimes disappointed feeling. And that's that difference between a gift that you want and a gift that you need. Right? Uh, We can think of this, if if you give someone a list of the things you want for Christmas, you might have a mixture of these kind of things on there. Things that you want, things that would genuinely, you know, Maybe not quite give you the reaction that, that the kids had in the picture, but, but it's something that, hey, this, I would really enjoy this. And then there's other things that, well, I know I need it, right? But it's, is it super exciting? Not necessarily. You know, for example, and you see this sometimes with kids, but, but not always, and, and every kid is different. But, you know, um, when there's a certain age who really likes toys, and then they open clothing, now, do they need clothes? Of course. And it might be a wonderful piece of clothing, but it's so practical, you know, sometimes that, that you get that, you know, more disappointed reaction. And, and we can sort of feel that way too, where, yeah, there's things I need that I'm probably going to have to, you know, as an adult, I'm probably going to have to buy anyway at some point. So I guess it's nice to get it as a gift. I don't have to go out and buy it. But, you know, it's just not the same. And, and so I'm thinking, what, you know, is, are there gifts that really hit both, right? So if you, if you were to make a Venn diagram, right, you know these things. So you have, you have the gift you need, and you have the gift you really want. What if there is that sweet spot, right, where it comes together? And yes, it's something you need, and you're going to have to get it, but you also really want it. You know, if you can find that for someone, that's kind of the perfect thing. Um, it's tough to do, though, right? And, and for every person, it might be different, and you got to really know what they need, and you got to know what they want. But when you find that, and again, every person's different. They might not show it in their face, but, you know, that's, that's kind of a, the perfect kind of gift. And, and maybe you see where I'm going with this. But in, in Jesus, God has given us one of these, right? He has given us one of those, you know, right in the bullseye, so to speak, where in sending the Savior, he has given us the gift that you really need and want, right? And we're going to think about what that is and think about the joy we have in knowing that God gave us that gift in his one and only Son. And so to do this, we're looking again at this section from the prophet Isaiah and, again, thinking about how the Savior came to to give us that perfect gift. Yes, a gift we absolutely need, but a gift also that we want and that fills us, fills us with joy when he gives it to us. So this very beginning of, of Isaiah 61, uh, I'm just going to read the first three verses and we'll kind of go back through them but because, you know, it's almost one big sentence, these first three verses. All these things, all these gifts um, that are really gifts coming through the gift, through the Savior, who as Isaiah wrote, this hadn't been born yet, but 
as Jesus himself, you know, preached some of these words in, in a synagogue in Nazareth at one point in his ministry, you know, he kind of applied this to his hearers at one point, and we'll think about that in a minute. But hear these words, and it, again, it's just, it's one thing after another, right? So it says, the spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me, because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn and provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. They will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for, this, for the display of his splendor. So it's all these things poured out, and it's sort of overwhelming, and, and it's sort of hard to even focus on one thing because, you know, it just, it, it's too much at once. So some, sometimes if we're reading this or if you're hearing it read, you, you can go into the, okay, a lot of good things. Um, I don't really know about each individual thing, but we know it's good. Uh, so it's worth, worth it for us to sort of stop and, and realize what's going on here and also to, to think about who's talking because... Uh, as I mentioned before, Jesus read some of these verses in the synagogue in Nazareth. And if you remember, um, he gave what, you know, as someone who has to stand up in front of people and, and deliver a sermon kind of message, uh, it, it, it's great to see Jesus do the, the perfect sermon intro, which is what he did. He, he read this text, and then he sits down because they delivered um, messages often seated in, in, at that time. So Jesus reads this text, he sits down, and he says, today, this has been fulfilled in your presence. And it's just amazing, right, to think that he could do that because he's the Savior. Uh, and, and told them all these amazing things, this is happening right now. It's happening in, as from Jesus' perspective, he would say, it's happening in my ministry, right? And the people there, uh, you must think, they must have loved it. And at first they did, right? You remember, they were, uh, you could say they were eating from his hand, right, uh, as he's preaching to them. But later on, they're driving him out of town and trying to kill him, right? So things are volatile when it comes to the Savior, and we know that fits with Jesus' life, right? People wanted to hear him, but he came to suffer and die for the sins of the world. And so we see that also in these amazing gifts that it's telling that the Savior is coming to bring us, right? And so to walk through this, we'll think about this, and we're thinking about how these are gifts that we really need, okay? So this first verse, uh, and by the way, the, the speaker here is kind of, in this, in this particular section, the speaker, we would say, is, is Jesus, right? It's coming from, you know, this, this spirit of, uh, this servant of the Lord who the spirit is on, and again, Jesus said this has been fulfilled. So we can think of these verses as sort of Jesus talking about what he's going to give, you know, where he says, the Lord has appointed me, anointed me, and by the way, anointed, that's where we get the word Messiah and Christ is anointed one. So again, pointing at Jesus. But to proclaim good news for the poor. Right? So we think, okay, all right, so this is something people need if they're, if they're economically disadvantaged, shall we say. Right? And so maybe we would think, well, if you, if you don't think of yourself as poor, we might think, okay, this isn't something I need, but I know some people need it, so that's a good thing. And uh, I'm just going to stop you right there because this is sort of different than that. Uh, yes, it's true that people who are lacking in resources and poor uh, need good news, right? But this is a different kind of resources than money in the bank or food in the fridge, all right? The poor here is that poor in spirit, that spiritually speaking where, you know, I can't do this wearing a robe, but like you picture someone turning out their pockets and there's nothing in there but the, the lining of the pockets. Spiritually, that's how we are before God. We can't bring anything to him. We can't bring our works, our efforts, what we bring to the table spiritually because we're born dead in sin, right? But Jesus, and, and God's sending Jesus as our Savior and King, he's come to bring good news for the spiritually poor, right? Because he is coming to fill us up spiritually with, again, good news upon good news, right? So these are things that we need. Again, he has sent me, hopefully, 
He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted. And, and we think, well, sure, when someone's going through a really difficult thing, uh, maybe they've lost someone they love, maybe there's just a relationship that, you know, has, has come upon problems, and now they're brokenhearted. And boy, it's nice at those times for someone to, to help them and, and bind up the broken hearts. But again, this is a little more universal than that, right? It's talking about, again, spiritually speaking, where we would be without the Savior coming, right? And brokenhearted doesn't, doesn't cover it. We, we sort of you know, equate brokenhearted with, well, that you're sad. But sad, that doesn't do justice to where we would be without Jesus, right? We wouldn't just be sad. We, all we could have is despair. Because again, with our empty pockets spiritually, right, we would have no hope of heaven. We would have no hope of blessings from God. We would have no hope of him actually wanting to listen to our prayers, Right, regardless of the situation we find us in, ourselves in, we would have only a God who said, "Sorry, I don't know you." You know, away from me. That kind of that kind of uh, reaction from God. But we don't. Right? In Jesus, we have a God who wants to hear us and who cares about us and is is with us now and has a, a place in heaven prepared for us. Right? So he's there to bind up the brokenhearted spiritually speaking in a way that no, you know, feel better soon kind of pick me up sort of thing ever could, right? And again, it's something that we need. It's not just, this isn't just a want. This isn't just, it would be nice to have. Again, spiritually speaking, we needed someone to do that. And that's what Jesus did. Again, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners. And we think, well, sure, right? People who are really in prison, that's got to be lonely, or people who are captive and you hear about, you know, prisoners of war and terrible situations and you think, oh, how awful that would be. And, and sure, we would love for them to experience this kind of thing. But again, that's us, right? That's, we would have been the captives, right? Captive in our sin, uh, unable to, to break free from it. And, and even if we could, you know, even if we're not sinning all the time, we know that even the, the sins we've already committed are too much. And God's going to get us for it. And we would just have this sinful world and then hell waiting for us. Right? That's, that's worse than a captive. We needed someone to set us free from that. Right? That's what Jesus did. And he still proclaims that freedom. Again, this isn't just, this isn't just a want. This isn't just a, I, I can put this on my list and if you get around to it, great. If not, that's okay. We need this, right? It's the hope that only he can give us. You know, he goes on to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God. And we hear this and we think, well, vengeance sounds kind of negative, right? And it is kind of negative, but it's that reminder, and both these things kind of fit together, that God will declare the day when he wins the victory, right? The, the, the year of the Lord's favor, and we know that's, the, uh, God's people don't seem to be winning the victory in this world, right? But we have that reminder that no, in Jesus, the victory is ours. And yes, there will come a day, that, that last day when Jesus returns and the day of vengeance for our God, w when we know his enemies will lose, right? And in Christ, because of what he has done for us, we win eternally, Again, that's something we absolutely need. That's not a maybe. That's not a, a luxury item. That is an absolute necessity that Jesus gives us. And again, he says it again in the, uh, um, the second and the third verse. So to, bo to both comfort all who mourn and provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. So these are all having to do with mourning. And again, you've been around someone who's mourning and, and they're sad and they're grieving. And it's one of those things that we, you know, we sort of hope we, as we comfort someone, well, with time, it'll get better. And you know, on this side of heaven, you know, it might not heal perfectly, but you know, it'll get better day to day and those things. And, that, and that, that's true. But again, this is, this is from a bigger picture. Uh, of the mourning that we would face without a Savior. That mourning of knowing that, again, 
Hell is all that we can expect, and it's all our fault. That morning of there's nothing we can do about it. You know, that, that despair, that if we truly took that in, what it would mean. But Jesus can, comes to give us the opposite of that. We don't need to mourn in that way as, as people without hope because Jesus has won us hope. And, and you get these pictures, again, crown of beauty instead of ashes. That was a common thing to put, put ashes on themselves. And we think of that with Ash Wednesday, that sign of you know, humility and, and sorrow over sin. Um, oil of joy. You know, we don't, we wouldn't pour oil on someone's head. We think, you know, how many shampoos is that going to take to get off? But again, back then, that was a sign of joy uh, to put oil on someone's head. So again, all these pictures of joy and again, a garment of praise, even sort of like it shows in what you're wearing because you're happy, just like you might dress up for a Christmas service or a wedding or a, an occasion that you're celebrating. It shows in what you're wearing. And again, all these pictures are talking about we have reason to celebrate now because of what Jesus has done. And it's even neat to think of, you know, thinking of Jesus as a gift. And, you know, anytime someone brings you a gift, there's that, there's that reaction of, well, I didn't get you anything. You know, there's that feeling we have to exchange gifts. Um, you realize, of course, when we're talking about Jesus, there, there has been an exchange of gifts. Um, well, gifts maybe in quotation marks for some, right? Because a few chapters earlier in, in Isaiah, back to one of my favorite sections of the Bible, there was an exchange. Now, the, the things we gave Jesus weren't so great, right? Um, oh, we'll get, to, we'll get to that in a second, but I wanted to read this from Isaiah 53. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him, and afflicted. He was, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds, we are healed. So in this exchange, we gave him our sins and the punishment for those sins. We gave those to Jesus, and he gave us his righteousness and his peace and his forgiveness. Um, is it a fair exchange? Absolutely not. The furthest thing from it, right? But it's exactly what we needed. And that's why, and now I'll go back to that other verse, that's why at the end of verse 63, um, they, that, you know, that's talking about us, that's talking about the people who receive these gifts, they will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. That righteousness of Jesus then has been given to us. And, it's not, and we're not just barely holding on to it. It's like an oak standing strong that you know, isn't going to be blown over by the next wind sort of thing because it's been given to us through Jesus. So again, that's, that's the gift we need. And that's exactly what Jesus gives us, right? That's when this, this king that is coming that we think of at, at Christmas, Jesus gave us the gift that we need. And because of that, it's also the gift we want. And we'll see that in the last couple of verses of our text here in 10, 11, uh, verses 10 and 11 of Isaiah 61, as we think about how it changes how we feel about it too. Right, and I'll read those verses here. There we go. Um, I delight great... Oh, by the way, this is now sort of coming from the perspective of one of the people who's received the gifts. Um, old Hebrew poetry does that a lot where it switches the person who's talking. Uh, so before it was kind of Jesus talking about here's what he's going to do. And now it's, it's us talking who is receiving these gifts. I delight greatly in the Lord. My soul rejoices in my God. For he has clothed me with garments of salvation and arrayed me in a robe of his righteousness as a bridegroom adorns his head like a priest and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. For as the soil makes the sprout come up and a garden causes seeds to grow, so the sovereign Lord will make righteousness and praise spring up before all nations. So the reminder here is that this is a gift we want and this is a gift that causes us to rejoice. Now, as I mentioned earlier in the service, rejoicing doesn't mean that we're happy in the circumstances every single day of our lives. Because that, that comes and goes. You know, when I showed the picture of the little kids, you know, delighted with a present, we don't necessarily feel that way every single day of our life on earth. Right? Some days we do. Right? And maybe, maybe Christmas morning or, or a Christmas Eve service or like a children's service like we're having later today, when you, when you hear that message of what God did and how he sent his son, maybe sometimes it can hit you in a special way 
where you do kind of feel that joy, the emotional aspect of it, right? And that's super neat when you do. And you see, like, yes, he really did this. And wow, I don't deserve it, but he gave it to me. Sometimes it does hit us. We're, and other times, again, our emotions can go up and down. Other times we feel sad. And other times we, you know, uh, are tired. And there are times where, okay, I know what he did is the best thing ever. So I have joy in my heart, right? And maybe it's in my mind, but maybe it's not showing uh, in, in my face or my body and I'm not jumping up and down, right? That's, that's part of living in this sinful world. But that joy, that is there, right? Because this is the gift we want. And, and sometimes God helps us to see that even through our tears, perhaps. But whatever our emotion might be, we have the joy of knowing this is for real. God has done this for us that we didn't deserve. He's given it to us free, right? He has clothed me with garments of salvation. Again, we have Jesus' righteousness over us. God doesn't look at us and see our sins and our mistakes and how we've fallen short and how we keep going back to those same sins. He doesn't see that thing, see those things by faith. He sees Jesus' perfection. He sees Jesus' sinlessness and righteousness because that's us, right? God has made this, this righteousness and praise spring up before all nations, and it's us. So I hope we remember this, um, not just at Christmas, of course, but all throughout our lives that we have the perfect gift. And maybe in, the, you know, in this last week, you know, you're going to be looking for, for what might be in the middle of that Venn diagram, you know, for people uh, that you love, that you want to buy a gift for, all right, uh, something they need and want. Maybe you can find it, maybe you can't. Right? But the good news is God found it for you. He found it when he gave you the Savior that you absolutely needed. You know, without whom we would be absolutely lost and we would be in despair and we would have every right to be in despair because there'd be no hope. But, but instead we have hope because we have Jesus in his righteousness and that's also the gift we want in our heart of hearts, uh, the heart that our God has given us, the heart of faith that he has changed to be one that loves him because we know he did this for us. So we can feel that joy and live that joy every day. So we thank God today and always for the gift he gives us in his son. Amen. I invite you then to pre please stand. And this time we'll confess our faith together in the triune God, and we'll do that using the words of the Nicene Creed. So I invite you to speak these words along with me. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated. We'll continue then with our prayer of the church, which we will speak responsibly. Uh, I'm going to include a special prayer on behalf of Mr. Patrick Courtright and his family. Um, uh, Mr. Courtright, we, we called him last week uh, with a call to serve as our principal and 7th and 8th grade teacher here at Good Shepherd for next year. So we're going to keep him in our prayers today also. 
So we'll, we'll speak uh, the prayer of the church responsibly. Eternal Father, throughout the centuries, you repeated and affirmed your promise to send the offspring of the woman to crush the serpent's head. Through your prophets of old, you continually directed the eyes of your people to the advent of their Savior. As we prepare to celebrate the birth of our King, use your mighty word to shatter our pride and to rouse us from spiritual slumber and apathy. You sent your Son to redeem us from sin. Let this good news be our joy and strength. Use it to cheer the lonely, encourage the fearful, and give hope to the despairing. In these days before Christmas, spare us from the stress of deadlines and the frenzy of commercialism. Direct our eyes not only to the manger, but also to the skies, where we will see your Son coming again, not as a lowly child, but as the Lord of Lords. Hold in your care, Lord, those who are experiencing physical and emotional pain and all who are afflicted by disease or facing death. Pour out your compassion on the grieving and comfort the mourners who miss someone they loved. And we thank you, Heavenly Father, for using us as instruments in your service to extend a divine call for another principal at our school here at Good Shepherd. We ask you to bless Patrick Cartwright with the wisdom and maturity he needs to consider where to serve you and your people. We trust that your Holy Spirit will bring us the very servant we need as we seek to serve you at this time and in this place. And Lord, we also ask you to hear us as we pray in silence. Come quickly, Lord Jesus, in your grace, in your power, and in your glory. And we'll continue then with our offering. While the offering is being gathered, we invite you to fill out the Connect card that you find on each row, and those viewing us online can fill out the online Connect card also. Thanks. <laughs> Please stand. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good and right that we should at all times and all places give you thanks, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, whose way John the Baptist prepared when he called people to repentance and pointed to Jesus as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Therefore, with all the saints on earth and hosts of heaven, we praise your holy name 
and join their glorious song. We give thanks to you, O God, through your dear Son, Jesus Christ, whom you sent to be our Savior, our Redeemer, and the messenger of your grace. Through him you made all things. In him you are well pleased. He is the incarnate Word, conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. To fulfill your promises, he stretched out his hands on the cross and released from eternal death all who believe in you. As we remember Jesus' death and resurrection, we thank you that you have gathered us together to receive your Son's body and blood. Send us your Spirit, unite us as one, and strengthen our faith so that we may praise you in your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him we glorify and honor you, O God our Father, with the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. And the peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. Amen. This time we invite those who are coming to the Lord's table to come at the direction of the ushers and come for all things have been prepared. You may be seated.
Please stand. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. Whenever we eat this bread and drink this cup, We give thanks, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us with this saving gift. We pray that through it you will strengthen our faith in you and increase our love for one another. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. And you may be seated. Once again, good morning and welcome to Good Shepherd. It's great to be with you here to praise our God together and receive his gifts to us in word and sacrament. A uh, couple of announcements. Uh, first of all, we do have a, um, one more midweek Advent service, and that's this week, Wednesday, and it's again at 4.30, which... We realize not everyone can make that, but that's why we put it online um, to have that 431. Now, this one's weird, though, because we don't have faith night this week. Um, so there isn't a, a meal planned afterwards or other activities. Uh, so you're on your own for supper, in, in other words. But uh, we, we hope uh, those who can make it will join us for, again, that special time kind of away from all the busy things, hopefully, uh, to think about how, what our God has done for us and calling us uh, as exiles in this world, but calling us to his home to our home in heaven through Jesus. Um, we had last week had a call meeting for a principal, and we mentioned it in the prayers. Um, we did receive a letter from this person that we called, Mr. Patrick Cartwright, uh, that I'll read for you. Uh, it says, Dear members of Good Shepherd, Merry Christmas. Uh, I was notified by Mr. Nathan Owens that the members of Good Shepherd have extended a divine call for me to serve as seventh and eighth grade teacher and principal. I'm deeply humbled by this opportunity and look forward to learning more about the Lord's ministry in Burnsville, Minnesota. I ask that you keep my family in your prayers as we consider where we can best continue to serve God. Serving God through leading a school is one of the biggest blessings that God has given me. I love working with teachers and parents as we strive to provide the best Christ-centered education possible as we train children in the Word of God. I would appreciate any questions or feedback that you might have that would help me determine where my talents can best serve, and more importantly, uh, if I have the qualities that you are looking for in a school and congregational leader. You can find my contact information at the close of this letter, uh, and we have it also. Um, I pray that everyone has a blessed Christmas season, and I pray that you find the peace which the world cannot give as you celebrate the birth of our Savior in Christ, Patrick Courtright. And uh, yeah, you can uh, contact the church office, or, or you can see me later if you want the exact email. It's patrickcourtright at gmail.com, but you might not know how that's spelled, but um, he encourages people to reach out to him. Uh, but even if, whether you reach out to him or not, keep him in your prayers um, and his, his current school and, and ours also um, during this process. All right, and, and speaking of calls, we had had the call return for a second pastor. Um, we've gotten the next one scheduled, but with the, there's a break kind of where, where calls don't happen uh, around Christmas now until the end of the year. So that call meeting won't be till Sunday, January 21st at 6.30 p.m. So it's all scheduled uh, but it'll be a little while yet, um, so we'll look forward to that as it comes. Um, as I mentioned, we don't have faith night tonight. That will kick back in in January. January 10th is going to be the first Wednesday where we have that. Uh, then our, our school is having those, those Christmas concert and program going on today. So the concert uh, featuring grades 3 to 8 will begin at 10 a.m. right here. Uh, and even at 9.30, there's special music from different students. Um, so if you're you're certainly wel welcome to stay for that if you'd like, uh, and that will be going on. And then the program by kindergarten through grade two um, is at four o'clock today. And then, now there is something for the preschoolers, but it's very short, and it's during the day and a weekday, um, so hopefully their families can make it. But there, there's a very short program, 11 a.m. Uh, on both Wednesday and Thursday of this week, and it's the same program each day. Um, and certainly people are welcome to come for that, but we realize, you know, during a weekday can be harder. Then, just to mention the holiday schedule, um, it's, a little, it's a little quirky, as it always is, right? Um, so I mentioned the midweek Advent. That's still going on. Now, next Sunday is kind of a weird one where it's the fourth Sunday in Advent. But on the calendar, of course, it's also Christmas Eve. Uh, so it's, the morning service is kind of both, but as we often do in holidays, we're having our holiday worship time, which is just 9.30 in the morning. So there isn't, there aren't, next Sunday, there aren't two services 
traditional and contemporary. It's one traditional service at 9.30, right? And that's kind of an advent service. I mean, we're definitely thinking about Christmas and talking about the blessings of it, uh, but the real pull out all the stops Christmas stuff is going to be that night. So our Christmas Eve evening service is at 5 p.m. and 7 p.m., and those, are, those services are both the same. Um, but those are our main Christmas Eve services that night, next Sunday night. And then Christmas Day um, is also that holiday time, 9.30 a.m., Christmas Day. And then the following Sunday is another weird one where that's New Year's Eve, is that Sunday. And we're also, so we're going to have the holiday one for that too. So it's 9.30 a.m., traditional service on, on uh, New Year's Eve. And we're not having an, an evening service this year, but we are offering the Lord's Supper at the, the morning service um, since we're not doing an evening service, so just be aware of that for that this year. Okay, you got all that. You've got it memorized. Um, there are refreshments available. Um, I invite you to, to join us for those, and be sure to greet one another. Uh, if you can greet someone you know and someone you don't know, that's great. Uh, but God's blessings as you rejoice in that perfect gift that you, you really needed, but also you really want, that's what God has given to you in his son. So thanks, and we'll see you again. Thanks, I didn't hear him. <laughs>